Welcome to another episode of the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. Finally, check out the Film Florida merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash Film Florida to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, and coffee mugs. David Morton is a PhD in the History Department at the University of Central Florida. David recently completed his dissertation on the history of the motion picture industry in the state of Florida. In part two of my conversation with David, we talk about the emergence of Orlando and Miami in the film industry, the importance of Miami Vice, the future of the film and television industry in Florida, and more. Here's part two of my conversation with film historian David Morton. Welcome back to the Film Florida podcast, David. Oh, thank you for having me again. So in our previous episode, you gave a little backstory about you. For those that may not have listened to that episode, introduce yourself uh, again and your dissertation. Sure. So my name is David Morton, and I'm a instructor in American and world history at the University of Central Florida um, with a specialty in, in film and media history. Uh, I had written my doctoral dissertation these are the Heralds of the Dawn, a history of the motion picture industry in the state of Florida from 1908 to 2019, which well, was the year I completed my dissertation. And my, my primary area of focus, I would say over the last five to six years, has been trying to develop a comprehensive and as much as possible complete history of film production and industry activities in the state of Florida from roughly the early 20th century, all the way on through to today. So in part one of our interview, we focused primarily on 1908 to 1950, roughly. Give us a quick recap of that era of the industry here in Florida. Uh, so there's a lot of ebb and flow happening across this period. Um, first of all, in, in 1908, it's not a foregone conclusion that Los Angeles or Hollywood would have become the center or the preeminent um, center for the global or American film industry. And although perhaps um, over oversimplified and perhaps over exaggerated by other historians and other proponents of this discussion, Jacksonville, um, although not in a direct tug and pull with Los Angeles, had emerged by roughly the decade of 1910 as a major film production hub in the American Southeast and as the nation as a whole. After a couple of uh, political reshufflings and, well, some disruptions that happened across the Jacksonville area, that industry more or less collapsed. And, well, the Tampa Bay region, very shortly after that, ended up picking up the slack. And as we had discussed in the last episode, we had a governor in the late 1920s and early 1930s who was a ardent uh, booster and proponent of bringing the film industry to Florida. He attempted, um, however unsuccessfully, to try to turn Tampa Bay into a third city for American film. And in the fallout of, of well, Tampa's burnout in terms of its effort to build it itself up as a film production hub, we, we end up in a period of limbo uh, for Florida for much of the remainder of the 1930s and going into the 1940s. Um, it's usually used as a secondary location, sometimes on location spot. But keep in mind, too, that the first half of the 20th century in Florida is still a frontier state. It's very difficult to access and to maintain a, a production on, on, right, on the regular. In fact, um, I'll, I'll do one quick side before we segue into our, our next part, and that, that would involve um, the production of, of the film The Yearling, which took uh, multiple years and several different production teams and directors and cast to be fully completed. And that was because uh, Marjorie uh, Kinnan Rollins had more or less wanted to see her film produced on location in Florida. It was eventually shot on location in Ocala, but it was a very, very troublesome and up and down production. So really going into about 1950, Florida still very much is the fringe frontier state. We have some aspirational filmmakers who do see some potential and possibility here, but 
it's a far cry from the major production center aspirations that communities like Jacksonville and Tampa may have previously had once aspired to. So now we're in the 1950s and 60s and the emergence of Orlando and Miami. How did those regions get in the game? Again, when I, when I do mention Orlando and Miami, uh, it does need to be understood that th- these events and, and these developments are happening Florida-wide, but we do see concentrations uh, of production in, in both of these cities with very different approaches and very different methods that end up in, in, in being employed. So, so I'll start with a more broader what's happening in Florida, then I'll go specifically into Orlando and Miami. So across Florida going into 1950, well, we we once again see um, a moment of transition within the film industry. And much of this involves changes in film filmmaking technology as a whole. Cameras are getting lighter and easier to carry, cheaper to move around. Uh, Outdoor filming is becoming much more common and much more able to do without trying to have to control the environment as had previously been conducted in the sound stages of the Hollywood studio system. So both in Hollywood, but perhaps across uh, the U.S. as a whole, filmmakers no longer had to be tied to the sound stage. Just as we had seen in the 1930s, they no longer had to be tied to Los Angeles, California, the taxes and the structures that had been put and imposed on production there. So we have filmmakers like Roger Corman, we have uh, filmmakers like Rico Browning and others who are, well, looking to create cheap um, on-location films. Uh, so, like, for example, Creature for La- from the Black Lagoon was uh, produced at Silver Springs at roughly about this time in uh, 1954. Uh, Rico Browning, who I just mentioned, um, who starred in this film, would also then later become one of the most important early proponents for the Florida film industry as a whole. So I'll return to him in a moment. Also, another major point of disruption that's happening in the media industry as a whole is, well, the emergence of television. So by the time we get to the late 1950s, we we have the big network productions, but then we also have the need to produce roughly 24, 25 episodes of a season on a cheap and affordable budget with a cheap and affordable film. And well, Florida, once again, ended up sitting the bill. So Orlando, um, which I'll start with in, in the 1950s and 60s, was still very much on the outskirts of both the entertainment industry of the United States, but also even within the state of Florida. You have to keep in mind that this is still just several years before Walt Disney had decided to build Walt Disney World in Orlando. And Orlando's greatest claim to fame going to 1960 is that this would be the nexus of the 408 um, Florida Highway and the Interstate 4 intersection. And it's a crossroads town. That's about it. And that being said, going back to uh, the 1920s, we had a few um, itinerant film productions that were being worked on in Orlando. Uh, the Authors Production Company in the 1920s built a studio in Orlando. It relied very heavily on the Orlando community, even ended up um, filming and then later exhibiting their film at uh, what became the Beecham Theater. So they were closely tied to the area, but um, just like any of these like smaller fly-by-night studios, eventually they up and flew. Uh, So it's a very interesting um, uh, discovery that I I found just from doing a deep dive into the newspapers of the Orlando Sentinel and some local uh, film lore surrounding the Central Florida community. And it actually involves uh, an effort from two individuals who had originally attempted to build a studio in Miami, but found that, well, Winter Park was cheaper, uh, easier to access uh, by, by the roadways, and also much more willing to literally give them the keys to the town to develop their uh, soundstage in their studio. Um, and that was uh, the Casey Brothers. They uh, ended up collaborating with the Martin Corporation, which was a major jobs provider and a 
source of capital for the Central Florida community. Uh, the Martin Company even went as far as donating to the KCs a 35-millimeter uh, film laboratory making uh, Winter Park and Shamrock Studios, the studio that the Casey brothers had developed, the only uh, film production laboratory in the American Southeast with these types of facilities. So in return for uh, developing the industrial films for the Martin Company, the Casey brothers were then also beginning to create some low-budget, primarily grindhouse-type films, like movies like the Terror from the Year 5000 or, you know, sci-fi, low-budget, just uh, B-side of the drive-in type of movies. But that being said, uh, they also had aspirations to build up television production as well. Um, a show called The Beach Comer was produced in the late 1950s and early 1960s in Winter Park. And as they started building up some greater investment and greater community support, they also saw an op a moment of opportunity to take advantage of Florida's proximity to Cuba to begin a working relationship with the Cuban government, which had recently, well, at the time, recently, in 1958, undergone a, a transition with Fidel Castro seizing power from the government of Batista. And well, at the time, and this is often maybe not known as much in the history of the Cold War, roughly between 1958 to 1959, many Americans were quite enamored and interested and very curious about Fidel Castro and the type of government that he was going to create in Cuba. In fact, Castro did a goodwill tour across the U.S. Um, even just before he took over in Havana, Ed Sullivan traveled down to Cuba to go and interview Castro. So trying to build some of the public curiosity and some of the overall goodwill, the Casey brothers reached out to Castro and his government and had offered to basically do a biography of Castro and tell the story of the Cuban Revolution. So the idea came, and uh, the idea for a film called uh, Babudos, or The Bearded Ones, uh, was then brought into fruition with the support of the Cuban government and with the dream of building a collaboration between Shamrock Studios and the Cuban government and then turning both Central Florida into a hub for perhaps also Spanish language films and uh, other workings within the Cuban film industry. Uh, the Casey brothers sent their uh, production team and, well, this big had cast the roles, but they had not sent the actors just yet. Uh, a popular television actor by the name of Don Johnson and uh, legendary uh, jazz performer Nat King Cole to star as the leads of the film. So they ended up uh, sending their production team to scout out locations and began doing primarily secondary location shoots when the Cuban government decided to change its tune. Raul Castro ordered the film to be confiscated. Several of the crew members who were uh, caught supposedly trespassing were then arrested. And uh, the producers and the Casey's literally got out of Cuba with the skin of their teeth. After they got back to Florida, they were able to negotiate the uh, return of their crew members, but they never got their film equipment back. And some of this equipment was either borrowed from the Martin Company or rented outright. And this was upwards of a million dollars worth of equipment for a struggling independent production operation in 1960. And that was too much for the Casey's to handle. And the uh, studio very quickly after that went into receivership. A uh, local grindhouse film producer by the name of R. John Hugh uh, managed to keep on doing some productions um, at the Shamrock Studio, but eventually it, it, it too, as with Kennedy City, as with Richard Norman Studios and many of these other aspirational film production companies, um, ended up more or less becoming abandoned and, and falling into, well, history that it still has yet to be rediscovered. Wow, what what an amazing story. <laughs> Let's move to the 1980s. And while a lot of projects have been very important to the state through the years, 
there's one that really stands out, and I want to talk to you about that, and that's Miami Vice. Talk about the importance and the impact that Miami Vice had on the South Florida area. Oh, certainly. And again, uh, I, I do want to make sure I emphasize that when we do talk about either the role of Miami Vice or the development of the industry there, there are other events both happening across Florida, but then also Miami, too, just like with Tampa, just like with Orlando, just like with Jacksonville, has had a very long history with the motion picture industry. Uh, the first film pioneers came down uh, roughly about the same time that we had filmmakers scouting locations in Jacksonville in the early 1910s. We had a effort to build up several studios in the 1920s. Um, and there often was, as in the case of Tampa and Jacksonville, very similar regional tug and pull that came from the aspirations of film producers and uh, studio organizers and the local community. In fact, uh, going into the 1960s, just as we have the emergence of the television industry, we have a filmmaker by the name of Ivan Tours who collaborated with Rico Browning to create uh, what became known as Ivan Tour Studio and later became also the uh, Greenwich Studios um, in uh, South Florida and Miami. Now, Tours had uh, toyed with the idea of purchasing a bunch of lots adjacent to a studio and develop um, a series of carnival-style uh, amusements, uh, popular amusements. He had this idea that he could get people to, well, ride the movies. So he could film movies on his sound stages, on location in one area, but then also you know, those very same tourists could watch both productions being carried out, but then also, well, go to a zoo and, and see animals and have the opportunity to see how television programs are made and how the animals are trained to act with the humans. So long before the idea for Universal Studios or Disney MGM, this was one of the dreams of Ivan Tours. Rico Browning, who, who was a close collaborator with Tours, um, also had a vision of building up the Florida film industry. He helped to form uh, the Florida Motion Picture and Television Producers Association, which was very active in South Florida throughout the 1960s and going into, well, the 1980s. And throughout much of the early 1960s, primarily with uh, tour studios, but also through uh, CBS and various other major te television outlets, uh, South Florida became a major center for production. Uh, Jerry Lewis uh, filmed The Bellboy at Miami's, uh, at, at the uh, Fountain Blue in Miami Beach. Uh, Frank Sinatra came down in 1959 to film uh, A Hole in the Head. And going into roughly about um, the, the mid-1960s, we have a slew of films and television shows produced by none other than Ivan Tours. And in fact, this is something maybe to be talked about for later, but there is this unspoken rivalry between Orlando and Miami at this time, just as Torres is building up his studio and his facilities and his dream of creating a location where tourists can come in while ride the movies, we have Walt Disney buying up large tracts of land outside of Kissimmee with the goal of, well, eventually creating his, um, well, Walt Disney World, an experimental prototypical city of tomorrow. And as uh, basically Florida's tourism industry begins to boom, both with the emergence of Disneyland, um, we also then start to see a changing of gravity, once again, with where the money is being funded to South Florida. Uh, Miami ends up going into a recession by the early 1970s, and in a situation very similar to the Great Depression of the 1930s, where the stock market crash had started the Great Depression, but Florida's land boom had collapsed earlier, Florida ended up falling into a recession several months, if not at least a year earlier than the rest of the U.S. had with uh, the 1970s recession. As a result of that, Miami lost a lot of infrastructure, a lot of support, and the ability to even sustain Ivan Tour Studios and the different visions for different sound stages. So by the time we got to the late 1970s, Miami itself has a pretty stark, um, almost apocalyptic image 
in the minds of the national imagination. So yeah, in 1981, um, we have on Time Magazine, uh, Nicholas Gaetano uh, created an article called Paradise Lost. And this image uh, essentially perpetuated through the minds of much of the United States, three major traumas that, that Miami was in the midst of. One was uh, the aftermath of the Muriel boat lift where Castro had supposedly let out tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of prisoners, and many of them had descended on the shores of Miami. We had 1980, the uh, McDuffie riots, which had burned large portions of the city and was considered to be one of the single most horrendous um, city-wide riots, both in Florida's history, but across uh, the history of the United States. And then lastly, we have, of course, this escalation on the war on drugs. And Florida, in many ways, and specifically Miami, became essentially that poster child for this idea of becoming a, a paradise lost. And well, it was just as in many of the other images being perpetuated about Florida, only a matter of time before storytellers and filmmakers wanted to, well, get behind um, and, and tell these stories. In fact, uh, the first uh, major story to try to tell about what, what had happened would have been Oliver Stone and Brian De Palma's Scarface. So originally, Scarface was intended to be entirely filmed on location in Miami, and several major location scenes were, in fact, filmed in uh, the Miami community. But, uh, of course, there was going to be, without much surprise, quite a bit of pushback against uh, the production, both for what had been considered to be the pernicious racism and stereotyping of Miami's uh, Cuban population, especially uh, the Maroritos who had arrived. And then secondly, uh, because, well, it, it did not necessarily put Miami in a very glamorous light. So basically, the, these city officials are scrambling to try to get their popular support back um, to try to maybe re revise and reinterpret their image. A local um, Miami politician who was so horrified by the stereotypes and the imagery that had been perpetuated by Scarface that he really ended up running the entire production out of town. And in fact, well, De Palma ended up packing up shop went back to Los Angeles, like even uh, the, the infamous uh, refugee camp scene that was supposed to be set under the I-95 interpass was um, actually filmed under the I-5 interpass in Los Angeles. So the film comes out, and of course, audiences really could not tell the difference between the scenes that were shot in Miami and the scenes that were shot in Los Angeles. And it was estimated that the Miami community lost about $10 million in production-related expenses for uh, running Scarface out of town. So Miami still got the bad publicity, but it also was then out $10 million. So this is where uh, Michael Mann and Anton Yurkovich entered the story. They had this idea for a, a program, essentially MTV Cops, if you will, and they wanted to try to come up with uh, this, this image of a city that oozed glitz and glamour, but also had sort of a seedy, dark underbelly attached to it. And this time around, maybe in some ways learning the lessons from what had happened with Scarface, the Miami community was willing to take in Miami Vice and, and its production, but under conditions. And much of this was first and foremost, to not villainize uh, the minority populations of the community, to make sure that there was equal representation of all, all parties involved in either crime or punishment for that matter. But then secondly from that then too, there, there needs to be a lot of emphasis on the glitz and glamour, just as much as the violence and the seedy undertone around it. And in many ways, uh, Miami Vice, by becoming that, that image flashed across uh, NBC uh, television on Sunday nights became yet another image uh, to the American popular imagination for what Florida was. It became a tourist boom. So just as I mentioned in the previous episode, going all the way back to the Spanish-American War actualities, these images of the front lines of the war on drugs and these images of 
that this glamorous, uh, gritty but gorgeous city ended up becoming so compelling to television audiences that, well, they wanted to go to South Beach and see it for themselves. And the Miami community capitalized on it. And Miami Vice became the first of a series of different productions that helped to build up across the entire South Florida region and in many ways helped to revitalize South Beach. The Art Deco, Art Deco District um, on uh, Miami South Beach, which was set to either be demolished or completely and utterly redone and renovated, managed to get the funds it needed to be refurbished. And the Miami Vice Effect, I, I could say pretty soundly, still has some very profound influences directly and indirectly on the community all the way to this very day. David, at the end of the 80s, the Disney MGM Studios opened in Orlando, followed by Universal Studios Florida in 1990. Talk about how those theme parks contributed to the film and television industry at that time. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is what is very interesting about the history of the Florida production industry um, in the second half of the 20th century. And as I mentioned, Florida never really has one major center of production to call it left around like you would with say Atlanta in Georgia or in Los Angeles and California. So because of that, there also is sort of a fractured tug and pull between different communities with their own unique aspirations. Sometimes it's a benefit where it could become a, a statewide effort, like with the uh, government of Bob Ram in the late 1970s and early 1980s, where uh, the benefits of having film production could then be spread out across the state. But sometimes, especially if um, both regional production centers have their own competing aspirations, that also could lead to an unseen tug and pull. And that, that is something that we end up seeing just as Miami is now building up in, on, on, on the wave that comes from the Miami Vice Effect. We, of course, then have uh, the two uh, theme park studios, uh, Disney MGM and Universal Studios, which in some ways ended up becoming the fulfillment of Ivan Torres' vision of giving tourists the opportunity to basically see directly and up front how a film production is being made, but also able to enjoy popular amusements at roughly the same time. Now, as uh, essentially we see the creation of these two theme parks, the idea of having a dual popular amusement and uh, center of production initially seemed like a great tourist boom. And once again, we, we could see this incredible collaboration happening between tourism and film production. One of the major setbacks, though, that did come is that, well, the tourism actually ended up becoming, to some degree or other, both for Disney MGM and for Universal Studios, something of a mixed blessing that the studios and the productions needed to accommodate visiting guests. And the noise and the sounds also sometimes would permeate into the sound stages themselves. And then lastly, in many ways, it's a question of aspiration. And this is a limitation that we see repeat across the entire history of Florida. And that is the question of creating a self-sufficient, sustainable production industry. If you don't mind, I just want to do one more detour back to uh, Jacksonville in the 1910s for a moment, because I see a lot of parallels here between Jacksonville and Orlando in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, a lot has been written about Jacksonville previously, arguing that had um, a, a certain change in government not taken place in the year 1917, the city's primary mover, movie booster, um, the mayor, uh, J.E.T. Bowden, had he not have been basically pushed out of office, Jacksonville would have become, well, Los Angeles, and it would have become the center of film production in the United States. And in fact, uh, Box had just recently, I think as of December of last year, created a, uh, a short mini documentary repeating that very same argument. And that argument is a bit oversimplified and in some ways uh, something that historians very heavily went at and it's called counterfactual history the idea that um, had certain things have gone differently um, neighborhoods like la villa fairfield arlington would have replaced names like beverly hills and burbank as the center of film production in the united states 
there's no way we could have predicted what could have happened next. But also that that argument that just one shift in government is enough to change the entire dimensions of the production industry is also a very dangerous oversimplification. And one that I could see risk being repeated when we tell the story of Hollywood East and Orlando at the same time. In my opinion, the one thing that really ended up causing the collapse of production in Jacksonville was actually what attracted film production to the city to begin with. And that was its proximity to New York. You see, one of the early points of advertisement that the film boosters of Jacksonville had relied on was that it was a 26 to 27 hour train ride, which was relatively short by 1910 standards from New York right down to Jacksonville. So because of that, they never needed to build their own film processing labs. They never needed to build their own uh, casting agencies. They did not need to have a self-sufficient colony. In, in comparison, Los Angeles in the 1910s, you, you, it was about a five-day train journey. You had to literally, like the Jamestown or Plymouth colonist uh, in the 17th century, pack up everything, come to California, and then make sure that you had... Um, enough to sustain your productions without any additional outside support. That constant back and forth between New York and Jacksonville ended up bringing a effective downturn and collapse for the industry as a whole because it never could become self-sufficient. In the case of Orlando, it it ends up being faced with a very similar problem, this time with Los Angeles. now, we, by the time we get to the late 1980s and early 1990s, have easy and accessible air travel to and from Los Angeles. And the idea was to film on location in Orlando, but you're bringing Hollywood actors, you're bringing um, Hollywood-based crew members, Hollywood producers, and people based in California to film on location in Orlando. And when they were done, they would go back to California just as we had seen with Jacksonville in the 1910s. And that being said, the community itself was incredibly aspirational, very accommodating. Um, The Metro Orlando Film and Television Organization went to incredible lengths and and developed these really great and insightful packets and packages to try to lure filmmakers in, just as we had seen with the Committee for the Development of the Motion Picture in the 1930s, or just as we have seen with the film boosters of Jacksonville in the 1910s. But the problem was, uh, again, self-sufficiency. Susie Allen, uh, who is uh, the vice president of uh, the Metro Orlando Film Television Organization, has a pretty sound quote. I might just read it outright because I think um, this helps to more or less clarify both the purpose of Hollywood East and then also why it it never really came to fruition. And, And she essentially had said, even at the time, that she thought that the term Hollywood East was kind of a detriment because it set an ex- ex- expectation by people and organizations that had nothing to do with the industry. The industry never planted a flag and said, we want to be Hollywood East. That was kind of put upon them as the expectation, and that was really unfair. It's like taking Simi Valley near California out of Simi Valley and saying, we're Simi Detroit. It just doesn't happen. So that that was just like one of the observations by even some of the boosters and organizers that in some ways, um, and this is something I've seen with a lot of the producers and even local politicians who want to bring the industry to the state across its hundred years of history, is that they often end up putting the cart before the horse. They get excited, they want to attract and they want to reap the benefits, but they don't necessarily have the infrastructure already there to then fill it out. And and that that was something that we ended up seeing with uh, the Hollywood East movement of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, Production activity continued well into the early 2000s, but by 2004 and 2005, respectively, uh, production both at Disney MGM and at the uh, Nickelodeon Studios, which was at at its height uh, going into the 1990s, had ended up shuttering its doors as a result. And David, from a government standpoint, you've mentioned it a few times. And now is when in the timeline when we start getting into incentives. 
And they didn't come into play until after 2000 when the government actively became involved in the industry. Um, talk about how the incentive game came to be, not just in Florida, but worldwide. Oh, that's a very, very good question. And um, in some ways, this is slightly beyond my area of expertise, but I can give you maybe a bit more of a, uh, a broader explanation. On one end, um, the American motion picture industry as a whole um, is starting to face a great deal of international competition. It has become cheaper in, in some cases to literally uproot and take a production and film it in Eastern Europe or, well, of course, in Canada or elsewhere and abroad than it was to film either in Los Angeles, but also in local communities across the United States. Um, we also see at about the same time a broader fracturing of uh, the motion picture industry as a whole because, well, just as we have seen in the 1950s, in the 1930s, and in the 1910s, we're seeing changes in the way in which film technology itself is being developed. But the advent of digital film, once again, costs have started to go under. And with the reduction of costs attracted to production, it becomes easier then to have points of entrance for other filmmakers, especially independent filmmakers, who are already working under shoestring budget. So like, for example, um, a movie like Cold Mountain which was uh, set in the American South during the American Civil War, could have been filmed in Georgia, but instead they, they filmed almost the entire movie in the Czech Republic instead. It was cheaper for the production to take all the actors and take the entire production crew to the Czech Republic to film on location and then come back to Los Angeles and then do the, the distribution than it was to film on location nationwide. So this is where state government um, in, in many ways end up coming into their own area of competition, trying to incentivize film productions to come to their respective states to build up their local economies. Of course, we see this in New Orleans, especially in the aftermath of Katrina. The community desperately needed additional income and while well, the state government really in many ways by offering incredibly generous tax incentives and community support as a whole, more or less gave filmmakers quite a bit of a compulsion then to start to spread out the industry once again. And going into uh, the government of Jeb Bush, but even before that, honestly, uh, you could go all the way back to Bob Graham from uh, 1979 to 1987, who was a incredibly ardent uh, film booster. Uh, he repeatedly traveled to Los Angeles. He worked very closely with uh, Burt Reynolds to try to attract film production to the state. By uh, 1978, going into 1979, Florida was the third largest production industry in the United States. And as we mentioned, we've seen a lot of ebbs and flows from the 70s to the 90s. And the uh, Jeb Bush administration, in many ways, wanted to capture lightning in a bottle once again. So additional incentives are called for. Um, as film production begins to wind down in Orlando uh, with the fallout from the Hollywood East movement, we, we once again start to see consolidation. And this is a phenomenon that, that we really had not seen as much in Florida up until the early 2000s. And that being said, there are productions happening across the state uh, throughout the 2000s. But for the first time, perhaps in the entire history of, of Florida film production, we start to see in center of gravity truly end up coalescing in one single place, and that ends up being in the greater Miami area. So as the greater Miami area becomes that center of gravity, which then could also spread out productions to Clearwater, to Jacksonville, to Central Florida when necessary, we also see some greater degree of organization. Um, in 2010, the Charlie Crist administration approved a $242 million tax incentive bill that passed through the Florida legislature with bipartisan support. And in, in many ways, this helped to facilitate another major boom of cooperation within the film and television industry across Florida. But then this is also where many iconic television programs are, are then going to be produced and proliferated.
temporarily set in South Florida as its uh, base of operations. The incentive bill was successful, and it, it brought in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to the Florida economy. But by uh, 2014, the, the incentives had dried up. And in many ways, this is once again where those rhythms of history factor in. I, I see uh, the equivalent of that $242 million tax incentive bill as the seed money that Trenton Collins had asked Doyle Carlton and the 1930s Florida legislator to help provide to try to bring the industry in. Um, Carlton and Collins had succeeded in attracting filmmakers and producers and had begun to build up Tampa as that aspirational third American city. And yet, um, just as they got the momentum going, the legislator, for economic reasons and for ideological reasons, pulled the plug and could not even sponsor the, their primary film boosters uh, funding to cross the toll bridge in and out of Tampa Bay. And with pulling the plug in, uh, with, within those incentives, we, of course, start to see once again another exodus, another collapse, a, another changing of, of the center of gravity of both the Florida industry, but also the national industry. And this time, instead of losing out, it, we, we, which I, I really do shy away from saying uh, losing out to Los Angeles, Florida ends up losing out not to California, but to Georgia as a result. Which unfortunately we know all too well these days. Um, and David, while the commercial and independent film production portions of the industry continue to do very well, it's obviously been well documented, as you just mentioned, that the last few years have been challenging for the traditional film and television industry in Florida. The last part of your dissertation asks the question, can it rise again? So can it? I certainly would say so. I mean, just knowing the way the history itself operates, um, Linda Stewart, uh, ended up, who has been a longtime film industry ally, uh, had put forth Senate Bill uh, 726 last year. And I mean, the discussion is still going on, the work that you're doing here at Film Florida and other lobby groups and supporters and proponents of the industry are not going to just give up without a fight. This is something that has consistently drawn me to the story of Florida film is in many ways, it is a perpetual comeback story. And I, I, I could certainly see that once again, we're going to see some type of shift and disruption within the national industry. And we're one more unforeseeable technological shift or disturbance within the industry away from having Florida once again sense a moment of opportunity. I think more importantly, what we should be doing in the meantime, since this is not a question of if, but a question of when Florida will become a major hub of film and television production and, and media production once again, what we should be doing, what we need to be doing in the meantime, is making sure that we don't put the cart before the horse as we've had done in the past. Make sure the infrastructure is available. Make sure that we, we provide ourselves for a nice slow buildup toward getting the momentum we need to create a vibrant, diverse, and multiply fascinating and, and layered industry that, that will be able to capture not just American imaginations, but the imagination of the world as a whole, just as Florida has been capturing the minds and hearts and imaginations of people since those first actuality films that were being produced in 1898. And David, all of this research has led to a book deal. Tell us about that. Oh, certainly. Um, so o over the last roughly several months since I've defended my dissertation, I had been working on a book proposal with the uh, University of Florida Press. And uh, I'm very pleased to say as of, I guess a couple weeks ago now, I ended up receiving a contract with Florida University Press. Um, I've decided to change the title of the book from my dissertation title. Yeah, so the Heralds of the Dawn is actually drawn from a quote from Governor John Wellborn Martin 
who was one of the most important governors in early Florida history in terms of building up both the road infrastructure and the infrastructure that would give Florida its, its boom in, in the mid-1920s and then ultimately bring it on the pathway to becoming now the third largest state in the U.S. Now, Martin is a fascinating figure because, as I had mentioned before, in Jacksonville in 1917, there was this um, controversial mayor's race. You had arguably this pro-business, pro-movie mayor, J.E.T. Bowden, who was running on a platform of building up the film production industry in Florida. And then you had supposedly an anti, uh, as described in the Florida Democratic Party, led by none other than John Wellborn Martin. And Martin had previously been argued elsewhere to have been an outspoken uh, moral crusader, an anti-vice crusader, and was upset and tired and frustrated by all the disturbances that filmmakers had caused in Jacksonville. And that's what caused him to run, and that's what caused him to ultimately run the production industry out of the state. But the deeper I've gone into Martin, the more I've gotten to know him, and that's what's great about studying history, is that you really get to know your subject by going through other people's mail. And um, I, I managed to uncover quite a bit about his own vision for business and infrastructure and, and, and all, ultimately the questions of, of how we have these two back and forth kind of ideas and identities around Florida. So he had given a speech to the All Florida Development Conference in West Palm in 1925. In it, he, he more or less announces his vision for the state. Now, this is a vision that he could have been fulfilled had film production come to the state and proliferated earlier, as had been seen in California. But oddly, this is absent from both the speech and much of his own administration. Um, and that, that is what it goes with this. Oldest in all its history and as youngest in all of its development. But as the facts of Florida's untouchable climate, its unrivaled agricultural and horticultural possibilities, and its limitless opportunities in commerce and in industry become known of all men, it cannot fail to become one of the richest, most populous, and influential in the whole family of commonwealths which make up our nation. The son of Florida's destiny has arisen. And only the malicious and the short-sighted contend or believe it will ever set. Marvelous as is the wonder story of Florida's recent achievements, these are but the heralds of the dawn. I found that so fascinating. I found that, that, that quote so compelling. I mean, he has this progressive, aspirational vision for Florida that we're now only seeing realized 100 years later. But yet, he was short-sighted in the fact that he did not see one of the most important natural allies for the state would have been the motion picture and entertainment industry. And that contradiction, in many ways, was the impetuous to my dissertation. That being said, with the book, uh, I'm going to be giving more of a general knowledge history of the industry. And also, the deeper I've gone, I, I, I think also the more sarcastic I've become with this constant tug and pull that, that had taken place. So... I decided to change the title to A Nice Place to Visit, But Don't Come to Stay, a history of the Florida <laughs> film industry. And that, that is drawn directly from the sign that uh, the mayor of St. Petersburg, Al Wang, had erected after he had brought the St. Louis Browns and the Washington Senators to St. Petersburg and had begun a booster campaign to bring filmmakers to the Florida West Coast in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And in many ways, that, that is the, an ongoing pattern that we see. We have this aspirational herald of the dawn, the, the, the hope and possibility for a new and brighter future that the state can have. But then also there's this pragmatism that in many ways ends up getting in its own way and often hindering growth and development just as it's beginning to take off. And that, that right there is going to be one of the key elements, both of my book and also much of my future work in studying the history of Florida film, but then perhaps more broadly, the history of Florida as a state, a community, and an idea as a whole. Well, David, 
thanks for being on the podcast. I know I've enjoyed the discussion and I appreciate you spending time with us and sharing your knowledge. Oh, certainly. Thank you for asking so many great questions. Uh, again, this is literally just like what I'd like to say at the tip of the coral reef of the, the history of Florida's industry. Um, I, if anybody is interested in following up with me to learn more about this very broad and fascinating in industry history, I'll be very happy to uh, show my contact information. Go right ahead. So you can reach me at uh, my email. Uh, so David dot morton m-o-r-t-o-n at ucf.edu i also am on twitter uh, at professor morton and yeah i i definitely would be very happy to talk and and elaborate any further on insights that you may would like to learn about the history of florida's industry thanks a lot david oh, thank you so much john this is the last episode of the film florida podcast for season two We're going to take some time off for the summer, but in the meantime, please catch up on past episodes of the podcast. Thanks for listening to this and other episodes of the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash Film Florida, and please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.